This morning we listen to God's word. Our first lesson today is from Romans chapter 3. In these familiar words, the Apostle Paul teaches us a simple but profound truth. What we could not do, he did by sending Jesus. Rejoice that you are saved by faith alone. Now we know that what the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. But now our righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice, because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so as to be just, and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. On what principle? On that of observing the law? No, but on that of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Alleluia, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Hallelujah. Please stand for the Gospel reading. Our lesson today from John chapter 8. In America's history, at the time of the Civil War, there was slavery. There's another slavery that affects all of us. Slavery to sin. Listen how Jesus sets us free. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This morning as we celebrate Reformation, we will consider these words from Romans 3. But now a righteousness from God apart from law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. friends in Christ. Four to five bedrooms, four to five bathrooms, a garage with extra storage, a big kitchen, a fully landscaped yard, first floor laundry, and a basement that doesn't leak. The perfect house, right? Good pay, great benefits, a chance to advance, company-funded pension, employee appreciation month, 12 times a year, 
and everyone gets along. The perfect job. A new haircut, a muscle shirt, a cute outfit, and just in case, Photoshop, the perfect image. Did you ever notice that nowadays it seems like we're searching for perfect in everything? We're searching and perfect for things. We're searching and perfect for what we do. We're searching for the perfect self. It's even beginning to influence relationships too. This search for the perfect. Maybe you remember this uh, this old picture here. Picture of the old advice column, Dear Abby. And a lady wrote in, and she wrote, Dear Abby, I'm 44 years old, and I'd like to meet a man my age with no bad habits. Rose. And Abby replies, Dear Rose, so would I. <laughs> Everybody's looking for it, right? Searching for the perfect. We want the perfect home, the perfect job, the perfect family, the perfect weather, the perfect self, the perfect everything. Are you looking for perfect too? How are you doing? Well, this morning we will turn to the creator of perfect, the source of perfect. As we look at these words from Romans chapter 3, you know what the Apostle Paul says. He writes, Therefore no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. That word declared righteous could also be translated justified. It has the idea of being right before God, or in a sense, being perfect. But you'll notice what he says here. He says no one is going to be declared righteous by observing the law. No one is going to be perfect. And he sort of takes a pin and pops the balloon on the quest for perfection when he goes on in the next verse and says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all of a sudden, you begin to come to grips with the fact that you're living in a world that's been corrupted. And that's awfully surprising, isn't it? At least when you think about how things started. Do you recall in the very first book of the Bible as God is doing this amazing work and he's creating all things just with his word and then every day he gets to the end and he gives an evaluation of what, has what, is, what he has accomplished and he says, God saw that it was good every single day. He saw that it was good. Everything he had made was good and right and perfect and even when he got to people it said in the image of God he created them that Adam was perfect and Eve was perfect on the inside and their relationship with each other was perfect and their relationship with God was perfect because everything was perfect because God is the author of perfect. So do you understand the real problem today? How did we lose that? God spent six days making everything perfect in the world, and now we spend our whole lives trying to make our little corner of the world perfect. And we're not doing very well. But do you understand the problem? I was talking with someone the other day and they, they suggested this to me. They said, you know, Pastor, it seems to me like we don't really preach the law anymore. I've been thinking about that. So don't leave today without listening to this. 
I looked up the old words from the old confession of sins in the, in the old hymnal. Maybe you have it memorized, maybe you've never heard it before, but listen to it again. Think about what we used to say. I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto thee all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended thee. Think about those words. When we spoke those, we said, I'm a poor, miserable sinner. And then we finished that statement up by saying, I've ever offended thee. And thee is a word that means you. It's pointing to God. Now you know how it goes today, right? Somebody says something, somebody does something, and the first thing that comes out of their mouths is, oh, I hope I didn't offend you. Right? It's probably not even the real problem. Not offending one another. It offended God. That sin offends him. There's the problem. And then we went on in that confession of sins and we even said, and we justly deserve thy temporal and eternal punishment. Temporal means in time, means right now. We're saying to God, God, I deserve your punishment right now in my life for the fact that I haven't been doing things the way you want me to. I'm not living my life the way you called me to live it. I deserve your punishment now, and I deserve your eternal punishment. Wow. Think about what you're saying. You know, understanding God's righteous judgment wasn't a problem back at Luther's time. At least it wasn't a problem for Luther. Maybe you remember this picture, illustration from his life. His father wanted him to be a lawyer. And one day when Luther was uh, out walking, he got caught in this horrible storm. Lightning was crashing all around him. He was literally scared for his life. And right there on the spot, he didn't know what to do, and he fell to his knees. I, I suppose you could say it was a prayer. I guess he had been taught at that time. The church was teaching people at that time that rather than to go to God, because you can't really go to God, you should go to some person who is dead. Talk to them as though they could help you or something. That was what they were taught. So that's what he did. And he said, pray... He prayed to somebody named Anne. He said, help, St. Anne, help me, save me, and I'll become a monk. So afraid he couldn't talk to God. And then you know, as his life went on, he started to study more, and he began to wrestle with this important truth and think about what it meant. That no matter how hard he tried to be good, that he could never be perfect. That he would always have struggles. That he'd always have vices. That he'd always be dealing with some kind of stuff. Always. And, and after doing everything that he could possibly do and looking inside of himself for more and more strength, he just came to a dead end. And he came to the point, he realized this is not working. I cannot be perfect. But he understood God's expectation of him. And it was a lonely, despairing place to be. How about you? Do you ever get caught up in the search for perfect, the perfect things, the perfect people in your life, the perfect self? And do you find that no matter how hard you try, there just always seems to be another struggle? There's always some other 
problem or vice. And that sometimes we're our own worst enemies. And that there's some things you just can't get past. So what do you do? I'd suggest that we do is what we're doing right now. That we go sprinting towards this section of Romans chapter 3. Where the Apostle Paul says, there's a righteousness that comes from God through faith in Jesus Christ. That when people have come to the end of their rope and they've discovered that no matter how hard they try, they can't find the perfection in here. That they come to look to a different place. That there's a righteousness that comes from God through faith in Christ. That there's a perfection. That there's a hope. That there's a peace that comes from God. That we would look there and it comes through Jesus. I found this picture as an image of an older picture of Christ. For many years uh, in an artist's conception of him, they'd often draw Jesus with a halo. Christmas isn't too far away. Sometimes you'll see a little halo over Jesus' head. We realize that Jesus didn't really walk around with a halo. But that's how artists wanted to illustrate the fact that Jesus was perfect, was the Holy Son of God. And it's because of passages like this. Like in Hebrews, it says Jesus is one who has been tempted in all things just as we are, yet was without sin. We recognize in our lives there are things that tempt us. Each of us has weaknesses and things we struggle with. Certain situations are going to tweak us. There are temptations. Jesus had temptations too. But he lived his life perfectly. John said it this way. He just said, in him, there is no sin. The perfect son of God came down to this evil and corrupted world to live among us. And why? Peter said, because he was a lamb unblemished and spotless. A lamb which was a picture of the sacrifice. Here was the sinless Son of God coming to this world as God's rescue mission for us. And when we think about who Jesus is, what can you say? Except perfect. Now here's where it gets good. Paul says, we've been justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. What Paul is saying is that Jesus came to earth to buy us back. To buy you back. To make you holy. To forgive you. Maybe here's a picture that helps us think about what it is when we see that cross. When we see the cross of Jesus and we recognize there's the holy, perfect Son of God dying and He's dying for me and He's winning a victory for me. And the person says, yes, that victory is mine. And you understand it. Because every single week when we come to church, what does the pastor tell us? He says, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It reminds us that for every single thing we've ever done or even just thought about doing, that we're forgiven. And that in God's sight now, He sees you as perfect. Now I know what you're thinking. You're saying, Pastor, I can't be perfect because I still do things and say things and think things. Well, think about it perhaps like this. God sent His Son Jesus down to be perfect. 
and then there's us who's imperfect. But when Christ comes into your life, and when God looks at you, he doesn't see you anymore. He sees you in Christ. He sees the perfection of Christ, that he lived in your place to be your savior. And maybe that's the way we need to start looking at ourselves now too. Because when we look inside here, there's nothing good in there. But we need to start looking at ourselves the way God looks at us in Christ. Forgiven. With his righteousness. The righteousness that he gives and what he's done. And then maybe we can start seeing ourselves as God sees us. It's perfect in him and forgiven and free and victorious. Just close with this. It's a picture of Martin Luther. Might be photoshopped, I don't know. But here was something that he said that I think is significant for us to think about as well. Because Luther was someone who took life seriously and he took sin seriously too. And, and, and so should we. But he took something else seriously also. This is what he said. He says, so when the devil throws your sins in your face and declares that you deserve death and hell tell him this I admit that I deserve death and hell what of it for I know one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf his name is Jesus Christ son of God and where he is there I shall be also Luther said when he heard those accusing voices from the devil or from whatever source, he just went sprinting to Jesus. That might just be the answer. Do you ever hear those accusing voices? <laughs> accusing voices from the devil? Maybe from your own conscience? Maybe from some person in your life pointing the finger of blame at you. Maybe it's even true. And you go sprinting into the arms of your Savior who died for you and who lived for you and who has provided exactly what was needed for you. And when you get troubled with things like this, like Luther did, then you say this, I deserve, I do deserve death and hell. But I know Jesus. And I'm going to be with him. And you know what kind of response that is? 